Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&As. I was a little under the weather the past few days, so I'm getting to these pretty late in the day on Thursday. You can see the sun shining through, so I'm having a heck of a time white balancing for anybody watching on video. But just wanted to let you know, heads up, like if I'm not as enthusiastic as usual, it's not because I'm not happy to do these, it's just because I'm a little bit run down. I really do love doing these. So let's jump in and see what we got. First up, over on Patreon, Double H wanted to respond to Oliver and the question of, does anybody else out there have a Genesis with the modem so that you could do net play with it? And their suggestion was, if you can't find anybody to do it, you could do it locally. Set up a PBX and connect the two consoles. Watch out for if the retro game needs only a phone number or phone with extension. They think customer PBX auto setup is an extension, but it's been a long time since they programmed phone switches. Me too, Double H. You're just giving me uh, flashbacks to over 15 years ago trying to help the company I was working with fix their phone systems. But that's a very cool suggestion. And hey, worst comes to worst, you could always just get two copies of Zero Tolerance, two setups, and use the link cable to play head to get against each other, head to head against each other if you wanted to. Alex S said their console setup includes a CRT that they love, but don't frequently use at the moment. In general, is it better to leave it plugged into a live out? outlet live outfit like you're gonna dress your crt i really am sharp today aren't i everybody <laughs> is it better to leave it plugged into a live outlet or toggle the power switch to the surge protector it's plugged into when they'd like to use it same question for consoles too interested in the why so the why is going to be mostly opinion but i have all of the stuff you see back there turned off via power switch all the time only when i use it now Mostly it's just because of what if, what if lightning strikes? What if something crazy happens in the house and I plug something nuts in that starts to blow out power surges throughout the wiring in the house? What if anything, right? What if water leaks down and starts to short things out? Whereas maybe if it was completely power shut off and or completely cut off from power, I would have enough time to dry it out. All of the what ifs are really why I do it. And I guess you get the bonus of saving from phantom power, but I, I can't imagine this stuff is costing me a lot of money if I were to leave it on all the time. But yeah, that's definitely for me personally the why. The only other reason too is that NAD amp that I got that I love, by the way, is still all finicky. Sometimes airplay doesn't work to it. Sometimes when you turn it on, it freezes and it won't switch inputs. And for whatever reason, leaving it powered off from AC at all times and only powering that on when I need it seems to reduce that. It's still really annoying because I love that amp. For the money, I haven't seen anything still that I liked as much, but I just wish they would take the time to work the bugs out. So that's really what I would do. And I would suggest you do it too. And at the very least, one could argue you're going to save a few pennies a month on phantom power that might be used. But what I would love to hear is if there are any technical reasons why you would not want to do that. Because if there's some debate about whether, you know, whether it's better or the same or what, you know, that's cool. I'm into that too, because I'm a nerd. But what I really want to know is, does anybody out there who has experience in AC power and electronic devices have any reason why you should not leave the power off at all times? I can't personally think of one. I'm not an expert, but I sure as heck have been thrown to the wolves and having to deal with power issues over the year and previous over the years in previous companies and stuff. So my gut is telling me just leave it powered off at all times until you use it. But I would love to hear if anybody thought of any reasons why that might not be good. Inmate 302 said the reposting from last week's Q&A, they don't mean to spam. This is not spam. Not at all. What I'm 99% sure happened was I got finished shooting the Q and A's last week. I, you know, I recorded each of the segments and when I'm done, I always refresh all of the support pages, all four at the moment, just to make sure that no questions got in. And then I sit down to edit, upload, process, get it all. I mean, that's like another hour at least worth of work afterwards. So what most likely happened was I refreshed the page and sometime between when I did that and the video went live, you'd posted your question. So this is not at all spamming. It's what I ask that you do. If I don't get to your question for whatever reason like this, then just please re-ask it. But the question is an interesting one. They ended up picking up that ODV GBS control and it's pretty good, but they couldn't use it with their PC and the HD15 to start. So I think you need to troubleshoot a few things. First of all, the HD15 to start has a switch 
for two positions. One is RGBS, where it just simply drops the voltage down to SCART level voltages, and that's it. But it does not handle the vertical sync signal at all. And then if you flip that switch, that's the passive sync combiner circuit. So that is definitely the first thing to check. The next thing is, I don't know anything about the ODV GBS control. However, there are some devices that just don't like that passive XNOR sync combiner circuit. PVM D series don't like it. However, PVM L series totally don't mind it at all. So there's just a few things that don't like the way that combined sync. So what are you seeing? Are you seeing no signal at all? Are you seeing like a wavy image over the screen? And I also don't know what the circuitry is on the ODV GBS control. Do, you know, do they do something to their SCART input? You know, do they drop the voltage, raise the voltage? Because now you're going through two sync converters if they do anything on there at all. So it's certainly something uh, that you should, that's probably worth troubleshooting just for the heck of it. But I would at the very least check the switch on that HD15 discard adapter and see where that's at. And then please re-ask next week and we'll follow up and I'll keep walking you through whatever you need. Jason Sherman just watched the Thunderbolt video and had a thought. While the total bandwidth cap for Thunderbolt 3 and 4 is 40 gigabits per second, you're only guaranteed 32 gigabits per second for PCIe, and the other 8 is for USB. So you might be right about that, but in all of my testing and in all of the responses, the awesome responses like yours, thank you by the way for taking the time to look into this, the one most telling thing that still is just driving all of my fellow nerds crazy is... How come you could set up an SSD, a very, very fast SSD through Thunderbolt, single device on a single machine, and get supposedly a higher bandwidth throughput than video capture? And that's the thing that's confusing most of my friends who really dug in deep into this and have knowledge of how these work. The one thing that people said was Mac versus PC, the way a Mac handles single device, is probably different. There was a little bit of discrepancies on that as well. My thought was then, hey, what if I take one of these Thunderbolt enclosures and plug two Thunderbolt cables into them and both into the motherboard? Um, these are obviously meant for daisy chaining, but if that were the case, then why wouldn't there just be documentation? Why wouldn't Avery Media just say on their bolt, here's two connectors, use one for daisy chaining unless you need 4K60 uncompressed colors and then use two. And also for the record, the Bolt only has one Thunderbolt port, period. They don't want you daisy chaining at all using that. So I thought that was pretty interesting as well. So I still don't really understand what the bandwidth limitation is and why um, nobody's gotten back to me. Avery Media, Blackmagic, Thunderbolt themselves, nobody's gotten back to me on this. Not even Sonnet, but I only tweeted them. I didn't email them. Sonnet's support is really good. So I think I'm just going to email Sonnet as soon as I have time to, probably tomorrow or the next day or something, and just politely ask because their support's great, their products were great, and I'm trying to make it do something that it's probably not meant to do anyway. But they were really cool the last time I asked them questions about stuff. So um, thank you very much for jumping in, but I just, um, you know, this one's still a little bit baffling to me. Eric Hurley wants to know if I know of any case solutions for Mr. that include original controller ports. They would love something all in one that has all of the IO at the back and USB or OG console controller ports and buttons on the front. They just wanted to check to see if I knew of anything. So the RMC one, the um, Mr. Multi system sort of has that. It's only USB in the front. However, you could use Daemon Byte adapters to get original consoles into that. And it has all of the ports in back. And it also kind of looks like a funky console. It reminds me of a PC engine, but it also kind of reminds me of, it, it just, it feels like a console that could be, it would be released in the 90s, I guess is a good way to say it. So that's why I've chosen to have that one in my setup, the projector screens down so you can't quite see anything, but I have that there because that's a mister. It looks like a console, feels right in my setup that I don't feel tempted to constantly pull apart and mess with like I do all of my other ones. But, uh, you know, most of the misters I use are for, for development stuff. Um, I don't even, even the ones that are in the arcade machines, technically I'm using those for development way more than actually playing, which I guess is sad, but whatever. So yeah, that, that's the one that I would kind of go to if that's what you're going for, but that does not have console ports. What I personally would love to see is somebody make a very elaborate Mr. Case that could drop into the um, 
uh, the new clear shells, the retro game restore shells, uh, including all of that stuff. So front controller ports that if you're using Super Nintendo, maybe it's the SNES ones, or maybe it's just two USB ports per side, or maybe it's one of each, whatever. But I would love those options so that people could have a mister that looks exactly like their original console. I think that would be kind of awesome. That's just my preference, though. Um, to continue, though, Eric had a thought to try out a 2U rack mount server chassis and use the front five and a quarter inch base to insert 3D printed covers with the controller ports incorporated into them. Yes, that would absolutely work. And on top of that, you would just need to find any of the Mr. I.O. boards that are mini ITX shaped. So the Jamix is a fully loaded one. Lou talked about one the other week that's essentially just a PCB in that size. And I say that with love because it's super cheap. It's exactly for what you would want to do because it would allow you to rewire everything. So I guess I'm going to try to find a link to that one for you just to see. I'll throw the link to the Jamix as well, just in case you're interested. But yeah, I think that would probably be exactly what you were looking for if you wanted to put it into a PC. And there's a lot of very cool PC case choices out there. So while it might not feel like an original console, it'll certainly feel like a unique computer thing. Tony Shadwick just wants to continue the discussion about shielded subwoofers. They have some broken speakers out of a Capcom Big Blue. Uh, so unfixable speakers, so they feel like these are perfect ones to pull apart to see what they could find underneath. And they're just going to continue to to do that. On a complete side note, I think the speakers I have that I ordered that will not fit my cabs are the perfect fit for a Capcom Big Blue. So I'm going to leave a link to the eBay store. Check those out if you want them um, and just, you know, contact me directly, make an offer, whatever else. And I'll try to get them to you cheap. So if you're looking for replacements, they're very good speakers, magnetically shielded. They're just not the ones for me. Um, so, yeah, keep me updated on that. Check that link. And also, you said the Ascend Acoustics center channel speaker that I bought is shielded, correct? Mine certainly is. I picked that thing up and did the test that you saw in the video. And it seems perfectly shielded. So I would just email them to double check. It never hurts, especially if you're serious about buying it. Are they going to get mad that you're confirming a product you're going to buy is, uh, you know, is what it says it is. So I would just email to double check. But I actually recently emailed them about some of their other lines of speakers, wondering if they were shielded as well, just because I was kind of curious. And while I do not have the budget to upgrade, I like dreaming all the time. So hopefully one day I could get some of their fancier ones. Jason Guffey said they recently got a job at a local auto shop where they actually want to pay them to solder things. They're pretty sure it's because they know even less about soldering than, than Jason does, but obviously they only know what they've been able to pick up from the people in the retro scene. Any advice I could give as far as soldering for vehicles versus the kind of stuff we regularly do? Any rookie mistakes you could caution me to avoid? Same exact tips except for one. I'll get to the one in a minute, but you know, if you're ever... If you're ever curious or question something, practice on something that looks similar. Grab an old junk piece of whatever out of the trash bin. Practice on that. Um, always, always just kind of look around to for anything else around it that you see. The, t the same type of things that you would always see in even vintage retro gaming electronics. Are there cracked motherboards, cracked solder joints, anything else? Just all the stuff that we do really applies to auto as well. The one difference is in many, not all, many cases, you need more heat. So I would just try to keep some kind of reference guide or something or ask people whatever you got to do just to know when that is. Because if you're soldering something like the wiring harness for a radio, it's probably going to be the same exact temperature that we're used to. But there are some much thicker cables that will require a lot more heat. And it it could just be down to the thicker the cable, the more heat that you need. But that's one of those things where you just, you know, double and triple check yourself. You always just want to make sure everything's the way it should be. But yeah, that it should basically be the same type of stuff. Uh, also, separately, they have the Otaku 6x1 SCART switch, and they use the RCA connectors as output. They heard from somebody that the little switch on the side toggles the last connector from being the output to working as a seventh SCART input. Is this true? And if so, how do they actually switch it? I have no clue. I don't think I have, I don't think I've used the one that you're talking about. Um, mine certainly didn't have a switch on it. So I, uh, I don't really think, I, I really wouldn't even know. I, I shouldn't even speculate because I just have no clue. And while a lot of those otaku switches were very good quality, there are so many revisions of each. I could, I could never keep up with all of them. Last question. Uh, 
Can I explain a bit how sharpness works as a setting and what causes ringing or hailing artifacts? They understand generally how software-based anti-aliasing works, but they're not sure at all how sharpness even exists on analog displays, nor how a signal can actually be changed to appear sharper to our human eyes. I don't know. And not only do I not know, I don't think it's the same on all flat panel TVs. And on top of that, I don't even know if your average settings on flat panels are even really necessary. I think it could just be one of those things that were carried over from CRTs just because, well, people are used to this, so that's what we're going to do. But I don't think sharpness should be a setting. I think you should just choose how you want to scale the image or or have, I think these companies should at least have more of an explanation around it. So I would rather just be honest and say, I don't know. And not only that, I don't know if it even differs between different models of TV manufacturers or chips, and the chipsets that they use. So I don't know. I think that's something that I would love to have a discussion with people who are much more in the know about that stuff. The one thing that I do know is that the way sharpness used to work on flat panels is definitely different because I've never liked turning it up ever, period. Whereas I did find a couple of flat panels where when I turned it up, I did get the haloing, but it also looked pretty good for retro, all, you know, considering it's a free setting that you could just turn up on your TV. Whereas in the early days of flat panel, it was gross looking. So there's no way I would have I've done it. And that's why I've always turned sharpness off. And, and to be honest, I, I didn't give sharpness a fair chance in many of the TVs I owned because it was so bad for so long. So yeah, you're gonna, gonna have to cop out answer for this one. Sorry, Jason. Couple of questions from D. First, they they know I mentioned previously that compiling all of my JLC PCB segments into one video would take more time than I had. It's That's not just it though. Sorry to interrupt your question here, but it's also that those segments were really designed for like a short, less than five minute weekly thing. And I would really want to do something that was designed for a 10 minute video, a half hour video, whatever else. So they definitely don't fit um, being stitched together and I don't have any kind of directory or table of contents, but I do want to work with JLC PCB to do some videos. I'm not sure if I'm too small for them to, to want to pay attention to in that manner. They've been great so far. No, so no, I'm not, you know, saying anything negative, but I would love to work with them and I'd love to work with a developer like T, you know, I work really well with, maybe we could do something together and maybe I could do a sponsored video and finally get <laughs> T paid for some of this stuff. But yeah, I don't, I don't have anything like that. I'm sorry. And they really are just meant to be weekly segments. But if it's something that more people want, I would absolutely do a dedicated video. Um, next, related to their previous question, and maybe moot given the answer, but have I or could I cover how one goes about designing and ordering a controller PCB that uses gold instead of graphite paint, or even cover how you would do both? They've seen replacement PCBs that look to have a copper or gold trace, instead of the painted on brittle conductive surface material. So um, that is something I don't know if I covered before, but in JLC PCB, you could just specify hard gold. And on top of that, you could email them and confirm as well. And I would just, as always, do a small order first, receive it, check it yourself, and then place larger order and always do something like send an email first, like, hey, I have an order of 100, 500, 1,000. They have to be hard gold. The edges have to be beveled. I bought the samples. The samples are fine. I, I bought five of them. So I need to make sure that they're like this. And most companies will guarantee it. And most companies, you know, worth working with, if they screw it up, will just remake them for you or something like that. But that's, you know, that's definitely something that I learned in the past. And uh, not to go too far off topic, but back in the day when we had a company completely screw us over, then they told uh, we meaning the older companies I worked with, nothing retro gaming related, but we ended up going through a broker in the U.S. And because the broker was U.S. based when the company in the Southeast Asia was like, yeah, whatever, we screwed up, not our problem because it was a U.S. broker they had to pay for everything. <laughs> so it was one of those, you know, created a bit of an awkward scenario, but the bottom line is we did not get what we paid for and we did have good production samples. So, yeah, but I mean, I, I really wouldn't worry. Most of these companies, most of the reputable ones like this want you to keep buying from them. So to screw you over on one order of a hundred when your next order might've been a thousand doesn't make any sense. So if there are mistakes, it's usually just a genuine mistake. 
Lastly, Robert wants to know if I know of any light guns that are compatible with modern displays as well as original console hardware. They're aware of the Sinden light gun, however, it's only compatible with emulation. I think the person behind the Sinden light gun also showed it working with a PlayStation 2, but there was a bunch of other stuff you had to add to it. And I know a lot of proof of concept stuff that I've seen where people were trying to do stuff like that, but I don't. there's definitely nothing available right now that can do it. And I'm not sure if that's ever going to be a viable option. You might end up needing to buy a ton of different things in order to make all of this work. Uh, converters, you know, different style, whatever's. Um, so it's kind of going to be something where emulation is really the way, the easier way to go. It's not the question that you ask, but for anybody else that's curious, you could use uh, Sin and Light Gun on Raspberry Pi emulation on the Mister. You could also use the GunCon 3 stuff on the Mister that should work on both flat panels and CRTs. So just one gun for everything. So I guess my answer to you would be today, right now, at the time of answering, no. It's possible, but if it's something that's important to you, I would look to emulation first before kind of going down that road. Well, that's it for this week. As always, if you have any questions, please ask them wherever it is that you support in the latest Q&A post, because the way these services work, I can't really figure out what's a new question on an old post. Plus, I like to just answer them in real time and scroll through, kind of like we were hanging out at a bar or a coffee shop or something together. It's kind of more fun and feels more natural that way. So any question you have, wherever it is that you support, just please put them in the latest Q&A post. And as you saw today, if any questions come in, after I'm done recording, please just re-ask them or message me directly if it's something time sensitive. But as always, thank you so much for all your support and I'll see you next week.